Morning all, I'd like to show you another interesting game of Mikhail Bovnik. His opponent in this game is Ilya Abramovich Khan. It was played in the Moscow tournament of 1935, so still looking at a few key games before World War II. Uh, Ilya Abramovich Khan uh, was born in Kub Kubishev, Russia. He was awarded the IM title in 1950, that's 15 years after this game, and I think became an international arbiter in 1956. He was the joint Moscow tournament in 1936, that's a year later, he became joint Moscow ch uh, champion and was a lawyer by profession. He reached the finals of the USSR championship on 10 occasions. He took third place in the USSR championship in 1929. So let's have a look. Ilya Abramovich Khan playing white plays e4. After e5, we see actually knight c3, a signal for the Vienna game. One of my favorite openings, especially for blitz. Knight f6, and now we see f4. d5 is the most popular move here. Black, uh, white now takes on e5. This is what you're meant to do, just take on e5 here. Knight takes e4. And actually the most popular move is knight f3. Uh, followed by d3 here. Knight f3 is played. And now usually black plays bishop e7 here. Uh, for example, bishop e7, queen e2. And we can get a kind of dynamic position where white can try and prepare to castle queenside, which is quite interesting. Uh, it's a non-symmetrical pawn structure. Uh, quite an interesting position there to consider if you want to try the Vienna uh, game after bishop e7. But we see uh, knight c6 here, putting pressure on e5, and often black plays something like f6 when he gets a chance later, as a general general idea. Queen e2, putting pressure on the knight. Now here, um, I don't think knight, knight takes c3 would allow that kind of position we've seen before, where white can try and castle queenside again with an interesting position. Mikhail Bovnik avoided that. Uh, for the moment, he played bishop f5, and it carries with it a slight weakness of the last move. That b7 has been neglected a little bit, and we see a very interesting move trying to maybe punish that. Possibly uh, d3 is a good idea here. Uh, in the game, we see queen b5, d3, for example, taking like this d4, um, and this this should be actually uh, a little bit better for black. Uh, potentially, and uh, the evaluation is actually an advantage for Black. Uh, it's it's a very nice position for Black to have here. So, in this sequence, um, D3, although although it's the most used move, it's it's not uh, great. This is this is, might not be a a very good position for White to have actually. Um, from a theoretical uh, perspective, from a kind of surprise value perspective, it's it's interesting. And this next move is certainly a surprise. Queen b5. Um, it's uh, we're out of book really after this, and I'm going to put on a uh, kibitzer. Black has some tactical responses here, which require some calculation, um, some some very dynamic calculations. Uh, does black really need to defend b7? Well, actually, engines suggest a6 might actually be possible, or even d5. It's a double attack on d5 and b7, of course. Um, now, taking on b7 runs into knight b4. There's huge problems on c2 here. It doesn't really matter about d5 anymore. Uh, so knight takes d5. That looks dangerous for c7. Uh, just queen takes d5, and that protects the rook. <laughs> uh, queen, you know that that this is a this is a troublesome position. And if white takes on d5, then again it's it's a troublesome position for knight b4. So queen takes, rook takes. There's problems here, and even this trying to give back a pawn. This this is going to be favouring black. Either rook takes d3 or knight c5. It does seem uh, theoretically possible that. Uh, a6 could have been played. In the game we see knight c5. Okay, and this this is also uh, very interesting actually. 
it's uh, actually threatening to trap the queen, believe it or not, with bishop d3 followed by a6. Uh, just to demonstrate that, if bishop e2, um, well, that that then the queen is trapped immediately with a6. So, with knight c5 protecting the pawn, this a6 is quite a serious menace to the queen. The queen's actually very short of squares here in this position. So white carefully plays d4 here. Now a6, and the queen has only got that square now, queen e2, goes back to e2. And then knight e4, it looks as though black's got such a comfortable position from the opening. And for, for me, something quite magical happens here. Uh, usually, you sometimes get pawn sacrifices uh, for getting strong knights on d5, but uh, it looks as though f5 is that really out of the question here? The f5 square. I'll recommend watching the f5 square very carefully now, because White's next move is a very dynamic move. Queen e3. You might think, what about this c2 issue? Isn't knight b4 strong here? If knight b4, then bishop d3 might be it it's okay it's about equal here it doesn't really matter this position if if taking we can take with a pawn we can get you know strong pawns in the center uh so we see this move queen e3 and it looks as though it's got a slight flaw to it the c2 square and that's what i find interesting here dynamically and from the evolution of style perspective it's interesting to see you know botvinnik playing against virtual gambits it's uh, it's basically a virtual gambit. So we see knight takes c3, b takes, and now the gambit is accepted of the c2 pawn. You might think, what? How how does this? How can this possibly do anything for white? White has got a nice strong pawn chain, though. That was a double pawn to take. This strong pawn chain can be quite dangerous for black if black castle kingside in principle. But it looks as though there's this defensive bishop. Can't that be you know put back on g6 or something? We see this next move, queen f2, and it looks as though the f file might be fun for white. And it also, of course, is gaining a tempo on the bishop. The bishop now goes to f5. Now, you might ask, well, couldn't the bishop have actually gone to g6? Uh, if bishop g6, then the queen is actually also usefully sporting knight h4 here, protecting the knight for knight h4. And this might be nice just to grab the light square bishop on the next move. Uh, so bishop e7, we can just grab the light square bishop. Um, and I don't know if black, you know, takes like this. This, this, there's compensation here. It's about equal. Uh, so anyway, we see actually bishop f5, and now knight h4. And the bishop just drops back to e6. So pawn up, you might think, oh, what, what's really the compensation? Well, after bishop d3, if you look at white's position, it actually seems rather pleasant. There's actually a space advantage, a nice aggressive pawn chain. And the f5 square has three things eyeing it. And a knight can be plonked on f5 pretty soon. If black ever plays g6, of course he's weakening dark squares. We see queen d7 and white castles now. And okay, here, what, what, what is really going on? If black tried to castle kingside, let's say bishop e7, knight f5, this is a bit of a pain. You know, if, if, if castling here, then actually this could run into serious issues. There's a very strong tactical move here, actually. I wonder if you can spot it. This is just a variation of the game. If I gave you 10 seconds here, what would you play with white? You might want to pause the video. Okay, bishop h6. This knight is really very, very uh, handy indeed. You know, if g takes, queen g3, bishop g5, knight takes h6, check. Queen takes g5, we're fretting now, mating one. Black would have to give up the exchange, Black's clearly worse. 
Now you might think, well, bishop h6, this just de demonstrates the dangers for black if he tried to castle uh, kingside. He doesn't really want to give up the light square bishop. So that looks a terrible thing to do here. Queen g3 forces another weakness. And actually we can just win the exchange. So it shows that this knight on f5 is not bad. Kasparov has indicated a knight on f5 is one of his favourite places for a knight. So White's gambit has basically accelerated a knight f5. And that's one of the beautiful things about this game. That This very rare game, I'm pretty sure most of you have never seen this game before. But for me it's quite interesting. Uh, in this tournament, um, which Mikhail Botvinnik, you know, dominates generally, that White has seemingly a very pleasant position here. Let's see how this goes now. Knight a5, trying to lock down on c4 against White playing maybe c4 in the future, and preparing a safe haven for the king on the queen's side potentially, or what might be a safer haven than the king's side. So knight f5 and Black Castle's queen side. So can White shift attention to the queen side? Well, queen e2. Betrays an idea of bishop takes a6 in the future. Queen c6, kind of safeguarding, and also you know, sealing up c4 against any c4 in the future. It looks okay at the moment, rook b1. And now h6. Uh, this, if g6, uh, I think white can use the h6 square, potentially with knight h6, which might be annoying. So maybe you know, black is preparing uh, g6, leaving the bishop on f8, just to kick the knight later with g6. Bishop d2. And now black actually plays knight c4. White well, doesn't really want to take and give black the big d5 square. There's no there's no real point in doing that. Or you know that that, that looks to be um uh not very useful. So knight e three now. I'm trying to evict the knight like that. Or provoke b5. You know, there's always a4. Uh, to try and undermine the structure here, if b5 to try and support the knight. So black actually uh, plays knight takes e3, which might not be theoretically the best way to go here. Uh, possibly the engine suggests just knight b6 actually. So knight takes e3, bishop takes e3, offering a c c3 pawn. I think most people on general principle would be very cautious about taking a pawn when the king's behind it. It's interesting. This is at move twenty-one. Maybe Mikhail Botvinnik is rattled or something, but um, he did actually take the pawn. Although there might not be concrete proof immediately available that this is a bad idea. It it just in principle, you, you know, it's it's risky uh, to do this. If he, if he you know he didn't need to necessarily do that. Bishop e7, what would be the dangers? Well, white could try and double on the b-file, of course. So rook b3. And black um, has to play very accurately here. Of course, the b-pawn is always a4. Now, ingenious engines in here find an amazing idea, queen a4, which I found startling. And the idea, if doubling, is to play b5. And you might think, what would be the point of this? Well, black does control a3. And there's a lockdown forcefully on a4. It's not a legal move here. So having this construction for the fence is, is quite interesting if, if Black was able to play like his supercomputer to defend this position. But uh, no. Uh, so anyway, Queen takes c3 was played. Rook fc1, Queen a5. So White's got a very aggressive position for, for the two pawns invested. What can he do? Here, well, the first thing he does is queen c2. So eyeing c7, and the queen's a little bit overloaded because now there's also bishop d2, and then queen c7 will be a disaster. So black tries to play uh, against this threat of bishop d2. I think that's the principal threat. Plays c6. Bishop d2 happens anyway. Queen c7. Okay, so white play here. There's a lot of scrutiny. On the queen side, b7, a6 is under scrutiny. a5 looks pretty tasty if a bishop can end up on a5 when it's supported. And maybe to this end, queen a4, which now threatens a host of things actually. Um, it threatens rook takes b7, bishop takes a6, you know, 
<laughs> Bishop a5, of course, uh, looks to be a threat as well. I, I don't really know how black can actually uh, defend this position. Black's getting actually mauled, isn't he? If, if we try and run with the king, let, let's give an example. Then here, actually, bishop a5 is, is useful. If queen c8, not only can we take the rook, we can play actually more brutal things. Bishop takes a6, for example. Rook takes c6, and we're crashing through uh, like this. The queen is not enough to defend Her Majesty. So Bovnik in this position is in major, major trouble. He's been exposed as being a bit materialistic in this game, to say the least. Uh, rook d7 was tried, and now white to play. And it's actually the final move of the game. I wonder if you can spot it. It's about as subtle as a wet fish being slapped in the face. So I hope you can uh, spot this next move. Okay, bishop takes a6. Look at these blasting rooks and the, and the bishops, the menace. And black here resigns. Let's have a look. If takes check, king d8, is the king making a run for it? Not really, because rook takes c6 is really vicious. That's going to be losing the queen or worse. Say so the engine suggestion is actually. Uh, not very uh, very nice here, like uh, bishop c5, ridiculous looking bishop c5 or bishop d6. If if we go with one of these, we're just going to take the queen. I think the idea was the check here. And we, we're just coming through with, with our attack. And you can see uh, it's devastation anyway. We can even just take that rook over there. So after bishop takes a6, it's it's pretty hopeless uh, position. If king b8, then we just um, play. Well, actually, we can play a number of things. Um, rook takes c6 is very good here. If the queen moves, we're just going to play bishop takes b7. We're going to crash through. Rook takes, king takes, check. And there's no defense. Black's going to get mated on the a file. Potentially, as an example, so it's pretty pretty crushing. So what happened in this game? It's I'm showing it because really it shows how gambits they can be very difficult to evaluate actually. And a key move for me in this game from this this guy Khan, very strong player, was actually this this gambit in conjunction with Queen F2. Not only getting a tempo on the queen, but also supporting Knight H4 to F5. And for me. That makes the game quite special because usually you see gambits to get a nice knight on d5, not f5. And I hope you find that interesting too. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.